Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name's Brian, and in this video we're going to be talking about some list building strategies surrounding Roos Bolton, Lord of the Dreadfort. So, in most of the discussions that I've done in the at least recent history, a lot of my focus is on attritional advantage and just kind of pushing that damage game. And with this video, I wanted to do something a little different and show some other aspects of the game. We still might be having a few attrition elements baked into this list build, but we are going to be hammering down on some control elements in A Song of Ice and Fire. In order to get an idea of the control elements that Roos Bolton brings for us, let's jump right into his commander cards, the first of which is Calculated Cruelty. This triggers when a panicked enemy activates. You expend that panic token from them, and then that unit, plus any attachments that it might have, lose all their abilities for the round. If they happen to be within short range of a House Bolton unit, they also take D3 wounds. So. This card is quite brutal. I mean, we're, we're kind of starting out hot right now. Um, to do something so low impact as just spend, in a, spend a panic token from your enemy to make them lose their abilities for the round, and that's the round. So that's not just the activation that they have to be ta that they happen to be taking. This is the entire game round. You know, the whole you go I go system, the whole shebang. So like, if this unit has defensive rules that could help it out, then those are gone for that entire game game round. It's it's just an insane how much impact you can have on a unit, especially if they happen to not have grabbed any of the out of activation abilities, whether they come from tactics cards or the tactics board. This just shuts that unit down completely. And the more rules a unit typically has, the more points it costs. And if we're looking at doing this to a, a high cost unit with an attachment in it we're kind of we, we can almost hinder an opponent's list by a good quarter of uh, of its eff efficacy for that round when you can equate points to doing work on the table calculated cruelty just makes sure that uh, you don't get outplayed by any of your any of your opponent's uh, big crazy units like even if they're doing something like sending a sundering unit into one of your good save units, you could easily just strip that off of them and make sure that you can keep that unit hanging around long enough when your opponent maybe thought they were going to be taking it out. It really kind of instills this idea of almost fear into your opponent too, because if there's a panic token on them, there's always this chance that this card could end up popping up. So the the bonus of just getting the D3 wounds on it is, uh, it's not nothing, but it's definitely not something that I feel like you need to really tilt the list build towards in order to get it to work. If you are playing in neutrals, then it works out perfectly fine, but uh, sometimes you might be incentivized to not take Roos Bolton in, in pure neutrals, so you might not always have a unit nearby, and I wouldn't try and force that issue uh, of getting that D3 on this card. Sometimes just getting a unit to just be shut off for the entire round is well worth it without taking the extra wounds. The, the next card we come up across is A Flayed Man Has No Secrets. This triggers at the start of any turn. You can expend a panic token from an enemy unit, look at one opponent's hand of tactics cards, and choose one card from, from it to be discarded. So the fun thing about this is if you, it, it's very flexible. Uh, you can choose to trigger this before you're trying to do something big, and make sure that whatever you're trying to do doesn't get hindered by your opponent. You might be stripping something like a counter charge out of their hand, or some other kind of manipulative tactics card they might be holding that you're kind of worried about um if you're playing against something like i'm j as an example somebody like roderick there's a few cards he has that are reactionary that can really hurt some of the things you do especially if you're playing against uh um starks in general you have winter is coming as well that can kind of shut down some of your shenanigans so being able to do this as a offensive move is pretty good but then we can also kind of lean this into that control side of things where if our opponent's getting ready for a big activation, like they've drawn a bunch of tactics cards, and we're a little bit worried that they're kind of eyeballing something, looking a little uh, hungry for blood, uh, we can trigger this card and just say, okay, whatever you had planned, if it revolves around some kind of big tactics card that you just pulled, I am going to really shut that down for you. Again, getting back to the Stark example, uh, you could do something like stop somebody from doing a sudden charge because you just strip it right out of their hand. I think that a flayed man has no secrets 
can really be shifted in a couple different directions, and it makes it a quite potent card. I'm never unhappy to see this at any point in the game. It is always good. The final card that Roos Bolton brings is Fear Keeps a Man Alive. This triggers when an engaged panicked enemy activates. You expend a panic token from that enemy, and then that enemy unit must make a morale test. If they happen to fail, the only action they can take this turn is retreat. And uh, one house Bolton unit uh, that they're engaged with can restore up to D3 wounds. So this is a little bit more techy of a card, and it's a bit more difficult to get off if you don't have things working quite the way you want them to be. Uh, this kind of goes into maybe terrain deployment strategy if you're allowed to kind of put your own terrain down instead of doing randomized however you're playing your game. You kind of want a bunch of corpse piles around for this one because you have to use the now valuable panic token from that enemy in order to get this card to do anything. And then they have to take a morale test. So you really would, would prefer to have that panic token hanging around so that you could force the reroll. So you're probably going to be wanting to target units that are a little bit lower on the side of morale, This, or, unless you're just going through like a, a, a Hail Mary play or something. Uh, you know, if you're looking at throwing this down on some Umber Berserkers, uh, you should set yourself up for some low expectations on whether it's going to work or not. But if this does happen to work on some of those like morale six or morale seven units, uh, and they do have some potential or some big combat potential, something like mountains men or uh, storm crow mercenaries with a lieutenant in them, uh, this card can really hinder your opponent's ability to do anything that turn as well. Uh, it, it's kind of like a double whammy because all they can do is retreat they can't uh they can't forego their action from what i understand there's a chance that they might be able to forego it but it seems like the only action you can take is retreat so that makes me think that you can't choose to not take an action i'm not 100 percent certain on that but i'm sure someone in the comments could correct me on that to make sure that both myself and the rest of the people who watch this video are all on the same page uh, but making sure that your opponent only gets to retreat freeze up one of your units and if that unit happens to be a house bolton unit they can restore some wounds so you kind of get this little a little bit of an attritional swing but mostly the big benefit of this is that you're getting a lot of you're getting a lot of uh control out of dictating what your opponent can and can't do and in this case if your opponent fails that morale test they can't do anything with that unit for that activation and that could be really damaging both in the beginning of the game and closer towards the end when your opponent's kind of running out of options they want to make sure they have all of those available to them and fear keeps a man alive is just going to take that off the table for them Looking at the cards for Roos Bolton, I think if you look at just those, right, you'll think that Roos Bolton isn't a very effective commander because how many panic tokens can you truly get out onto units, especially since if you're looking at it from a uh, neutrals-only perspective, it can kind of be a little bit more difficult to make that happen. But Roos Bolton has two really great things going for him. First, he's an NCU commander, which can definitely save you some points in your list building. But the other thing is that he ends up bringing an ability called Horrific Rumors. Now this is uh, when he claims a zone on the tactics board, uh, you can replace that zone's effect with putting up to two uh, panic tokens, or well, panicking up to two enemy units. Uh, and that's kind of how we can get the ball rolling. I think that there are definitely abilities on the tactics board that we want to be utilizing, and sometimes it's just not great to put out all these panic tokens when you could be using one of the tactics board zones to get this really cool effect or one that might help you uh, win the game. But it's just the thing, the nuance of Roos Bolton is trying to figure out when you need to get these panic tokens out and when you shouldn't be getting them out. And as I had said earlier, there's this like, it's kind of interesting because there's this built-in fear type thing that you can get going on with your opponent where if you do happen to uh, play Roos Bolton on one of the zones and use the Horrific Rumors ability, your opponent's going to start thinking that you have some of these really damaging cards in your hand, and they're going to play a little bit more conservatively. So it's, it's the, like I said, it's just this really phenomenal thing that happens in the game where 
you kind of get into your opponent's headspace and kind of control them from that aspect too. You've got some control elements inside your army, but you also have it kind of going on this psychological level, and it's just such a cool thing to have happen. I think if if you haven't used Roose Bolton as a as a non neutral, I think it's definitely worth trying it out if you uh, if you get the chance to because it's just this really cool effect as soon as you play one of his big cards on someone they're like oh i've got to watch out for those it also kind of forces them to do things like take the coin zone when they really don't need to heal anything and they can only use it to get a panic token off of somebody because they're really worried about that unit getting shut down and we have plenty of other ways to get panic tokens on this on these units as well just from the tactics board or maybe some other options that you can build in but uh the the big thing we sacrifice with this by getting this cool, like, neat, fun effect, is that Roos Bolton doesn't score us any extra points like one of these on-the-table commanders does, but I think the elements that he brings give us the ability to not really worry about that so much since we are kind of dictating a lot of our opponent's moves. So for this particular list, I've decided to build it as a Lannister list instead of a neutral list. Now, the, the neutral tactics deck is really interesting. It's got a lot of Swiss Army-type things in it and the ability to recycle something like calculated cruelty is really uh, effective but I wanted to kind of pull in some more panic elements with this one so I've decided to go with Lannister not just for that but also we get access to counterplot and I know it's just one card that there are two copies of in the deck but being able to layer all these other control abilities on to our opponent and then have something like uh, like counterplot hanging around or any of the other like really big uh, damaging things on the table like Fealty the Crown's another one that people don't quite see coming with this type of list. I think that uh, it gives us this really hard control element that I'm really striving for in this build. So the first thing that I've decided to plop into this list is Knights of Casterly Rock. And I know that uh, this is kind of the flagship unit for dealing damage in a Lannister list, and that's really what they're here for too. Uh, uh, we have a, a couple different ways of kind of locking our opponent up, and instead of kind of delivering the Knights of Casterly Rock to just go wreck havoc on the sides of the table, we really want these guys to be uh, kind of targeting specific units that we want to shut down, so we can either we kind of control them by getting them off the table. There's just going to be there are going to be elements during the game that we can't control, and uh, the Knights of Casterly Rock are there to try and plow through some of these things. If you think from like a magic perspective if you've ever played the game uh like the big old blue white control decks of old which i imagine people still play these days you always try to control things that are going on in the table and in the or through spells or counter spells or whatever and then you have like the big bad guy who's like this is the thing that's going to win me the game once i've controlled you to the point where you're out of options that's kind of what the knights of casterly rock are going to be doing but on a little bit more of a proactive scale they're also kind of kind of going after our opponent's things just so we can swing the momentum of the game in our favor so we can slow it down to where we want and we don't have any steamroller units just blasting through our stuff and then we can just close the game out later with them when our opponents just don't have any juice to deal with these guys and just run around and do whatever they want next up i've decided to add lannister crossbowmen and this unit is a solid unit. They throw a ton of dice, and they're very consistent with it. So there's, they have a seven-seven-three attack profile with that crossbow. They hit on threes, so they're hitting quite accurate, and they don't have a lot of other great stats. You know, they're they're not super fast. They don't have a great save. Their morale's terrible. But the thing with these is that we're going to kind of be using them to throw some more attacks at things that we also can't deal with. Think of, you know, when I talked about earlier with those Knights of Casterly Rock, sometimes the Lannister crossbowmen are going to be used to soften up the target to make sure that this the Knights of Castle Rock can bulldoze through it, or they might be trying to shoot off something that's engaged with the knights so that then so that they can then go off and do whatever they need to. The Lannister crossbowmen kind of exist in this list to be a reactionary unit to solve problems, and that's kind of playing more into our control as well. And there are a few other elements in this list that are going to take advantage of what the Lannister crossbowmen are going to do, but in order to keep the pressure up on uh, 
on this control element, which we're brilliant, we're pulling a lot of that in from our tactics deck. I've decided to attach Preston Greenfield to this unit, and uh, Preston Greenfield just brings prosperity to the crown. I don't think that this Lannister crossbowman with Greenfield thing is a is a new concept by any means. I think when they first came out, this was one of or when the Kingsguard first came out, this was one of the first units that they kind of got plopped into. They enjoy getting the maneuver position to get into a spot to where they can shoot better. That'll help you draw a card if you have the crown zone and they also like shooting out of the sequence and having their activation to do things later so if you take the combat zone you end up shooting with this unit you end up drawing another card and then when they go again you draw another card so the the we can keep this controlling pressure on our opponent by just turning this unit into a machine of card draw and I think that that's really important for this list to make sure that we don't fall behind if our opponent happens to take the tactic zone out from under us which is pretty likely because they're going to be afraid of getting more panic tokens that aren't just coming from Roos Bolton because 100% will probably be dropping those on them too through that zone. The next unit that I've brought along is is one unit of House Bolton Cutthroat. So this is our first Bolton unit that we've come across, and a lot of the reason that I have them in here is that they do help trigger some of those extra effects on some of Roos's cards, and that it's always nice to have those. You want to make sure you have that option if it's needed, especially with the D3 wounds. Uh, sometimes it can be enough to just kind of push a unit over the edge of being uh, destroyed when you're kind of uh, not running on empty, but at least when, when things are looking a little rough and you need to dig deep. So the other thing that these guys happen to bring is a way to utilize those panic tokens that we get. Uh, with having Vicious and just a, a phenomenal attack profile, uh, this, this unit's quite glassy, but since we are coming at, at this list from a control perspective, we're able to get them into what we want to get them into and make sure that there aren't other units that are kind of preying on them because we have a lot of things that are going to shut down those enemy units and make sure that these guys can kind of play in the sprinkler, if you will. They also have that spiked mace ability that lets them get some vulnerable tokens out. So they kind of... They feel a little bit like Knights of Casterly Rock and that they want to kind of be bulldozing through units between the Panic Check, the Vulnerable Tokens, and uh, the Vicious. But really, they're, they're an inexpensive unit that does a lot of work, and I feel like we're going to get a lot more out of them because of Roos's cards. Next up in the list, I don't think that we could really have a controlling build without some kind of unit that's just going to dig in and get stuck and be very difficult for our opponent to remove if they happen to go into them. And that's going to be the House Bolton Blackguard. This gives us another B Bolton unit which can help out Roos's effects on the cards, especially if you look at uh, Fear Keeps a Man Alive, healing back D3 unit or D3 models back into this unit when your opponent's trying to go after them. That can be quite a devastating thing, especially when you're taking that other unit's attack away from them. And you're still going to be punishing them if they do happen to pass that morale test because I got to do it again for horrific visage so there's just a lot of elements to there's a lot of synergistic elements I guess to this unit being included in the list they don't have the greatest attack profile but that's not really their selling point they just want to get somewhere and exist and since they have decent a decent save and a decent armor stat or a decent save and decent morale stat sorry uh, I feel like this is going to be that unit that can definitely hold down an objective and make sure that our opponent uh, gets punished quite hard for coming after it, especially if we happen to put them next to a uh, corpse pile. And then we've got all those panic tokens coming out. So this is just another way of focusing on those multi-layer pieces to how the panic tokens are really going to be affecting our opponent. We can really make things difficult for them. And sometimes, not that I would say that this is a main tactic, but you can definitely confuse and throw your opponent off to where they kind of forget that the panic tokens can be used during the horrific visage and that might actually hurt them more than anything you could do with Roos's cards at that particular point in time. You know, taking a unit down from two ranks to one can really be enough to shut them out from doing any work to this unit. Now the final combat unit, yep, you heard that right, five combat units. It's, it's, the, it's the, the, the golden number here. Uh, the last combat unit is a little bit on the funky side. So I could definitely see someone wanting to take this unit out and maybe bolster some attachments into the army because this army takes attachments really well. 
or you could switch it for another five point unit that I happen to be that you might be interested in from the Lannister's perspective. But I am putting in a unit of poor fellows as much as they don't feel like they fit here. And the main reason for this is it's just like the uh, cutthroats. I want to try and have a unit that it, well, it's kind of like the cutthroats in the 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 Blackguard kind of merge together because these guys don't have the greatest defensive stats, but that three plus morale is legit. So they have the ability to get stuck into combat. They're not going to do a ton of damage, but with that faith ability, they could definitely push some wounds across and get some uh, automatic panic checks to trigger. And they're going to be kicking around quite a bit with uh, reinforcements. You know, that this unit is, on the surface, does not look like it's very difficult to get rid of, but it really is. That 3-plus morale saves them from losing any ranks from panic checks and i think it's only happened once to me in the entire time i've been playing and uh reinforcements make sure that they kind of stick around this is the unit that your opponent wants to kind of deal with because they think they can steamroll right through them but then they end up getting really frustrated that they ever made that choice because they're really hard to get unstuck from and the more they hit them the more they're just going to be damaging themselves because of the fanatical zeal ability that this unit brings the other thing, the reason why I say they're kind of like cutthroats is because we can put this unit into what we want to get it into because we are still kind of doing that control perspective. So if our opponent has this unit that's stacked with a ton of rules, we have a way of just saying we're going to get rid of those rules and now you're not so impressive and you're just going to be, you know, kind of flailing with poor fellows for a while. Now, if you're not into this unit, I would definitely first try it out and see what you think of it because I do believe that people don't give this unit enough respect in non-faith based lists and uh, it's definitely worth trying at least one game to see how it goes for you but you could switch them out for Lannister Guard. The issue with that is that the five points are the last five points we're using for the list before we get to NCUs. So if you want to tinker with those, that's the only way you're going to get a Lannister ca Guard Captain in here and I don't feel like those are so auto take with them like they used to be but seven plus morale is still not the greatest stat so if you're wanting to try and get more work out of uh, uh, La the Lannister intimidation then I feel like that's kind of what you need to have in there or something you could go crazy and put Barristan Selmy in there because then he makes that unit an absolute truck but uh, and then you're just kind of replicating the uh, Blackguard at that point but if that's the you want to go, which I 100% could see someone wanting to do. One of my favorite roost lists played with uh, double Lannister Guard, but this was in times of yore when things were very different back then. But the poor fellows here feel good to me. Uh, but again, like I, you could also take other attachments for other units. I think that uh, putting something like Bronn in a unit of uh, House Bolton Cutthroats is really nasty. I think at one point I had Jamie non King's Guard in there because uh, Boldness and Courage is such a cool ability for them because they just become this non stop meat grinder that your opponent can't deal with as quickly as they want to. Because usually when you start taking chunks out of Cutthroats, they get a little bit lower on that performance. You're really kind of dealing, with, you're really leaning in on the vicious aspect of them. But with Jamie in there, uh, they they throw 10 dice at, at front and then go down to 8 and then 6, so they're always dangerous. They never stop being dangerous. But uh, it really is season to taste with that last option. I really feel like the poor fellows have a good place here, and they're uh, definitely another one of those units that can mess with your opponent's head if they really don't respect them. So if you've been paying attention to the points, you'll realize that our NCU setup is going to have three NCUs total because Roost Bolton's free, but then there's nine points hanging around, so we're getting a little bit hefty on that NCU uh, suite. But I do believe that this really solidifies the list into super-duper control, and I don't think you can talk about control without talking about Walder Frey. So, five-point NCU, but his ability backing the winning side can just be back-breaking, especially since we have a couple other cards in here that are going to be taking away our opponent's efficacy. You think of, like, a Paid Mutiny kind of shutting off an attachment from a unit, Calculated Cruelty shutting down a unit, it, and then fear keeps a man alive, making a unit kind of worthless when it activates if it happens to fail its morale test. But now we've got another layer of that where if you happen to own the crown, which we will want to because Preston Greenfield is there, we can just shut down another unit. Man, at worst, 
the at the absolute worst, while their fray does one wound to something, which isn't terrible, especially given that we've got dogs and bears running around, uh, he can definitely kind of snipe those out. It's not the greatest use for him, but it's something that he can do. The thing that I had not that I didn't mention was that the downside to Walder Frey is that if our opponent takes the crown, he kind of becomes useless. And I don't think that's the case because we're going to get back to this idea of playing with our opponent's head where they don't want to let us take the crown because we can definitely utilize a lot of those panic checks and uh, just throwing one out from the the crown zone. Uh, is can be pretty devastating. We're still a Lannister player, so we have things like Fealty to the Crown and uh, uh, and and all those other fun cards that kind of play off of panic checks, like Hear Me Roar being a really good example. Um, even without Cersei, the Hear Me Roar panic check Crown Bomb can be really devastating to the right unit. So we kind of force this other decision matrix on our opponent so they're kind of we're kind of attacking them from all fronts they have to pay a lot of attention to what's going on on the tactics board they have to pay a lot of attention to what's going on in our hand even though they have no idea what's happening and then they have to pay a lot of attention to the panic tokens they have on the table and what different parts or what how we're going to be utilizing them differently there's just a lot of things to chew on with this list and i think it's one of the really big deals about how how this list can control is it not just has the hard control built into it but it also just has a lot of things that you need to focus on and makes it really efficient and walder Frey is a really big part of that so even if you don't get the crown zone to kind of turn on backing the winning side you're at least messing with your opponent and getting another zone that might be just as devastating if you're kind of planning for that to to happen. I think he's a perfect choice for this list, and I would have a really hard time cutting him from it. Our final NCU is probably going to be a little bit more of a controversial one coming in at four points. Uh, This is going to be Tywin Lannister. And the Reigns of Castamere is just a really nasty nasty ability um he just once per game at the start of any turn he can choose an enemy combat unit they become panicked vulnerable and weakened and any of its attachments as well as the unit lose all of their abilities until the end of the round so we have so many ways of shutting down units you know i just listed them off in the walder Frey discussion and now we have another one with tywin but he also does something else really special for and he gets all those tokens out so if we happen to be really scraping the bottom of the barrel on panic tokens we can make sure that we've just got them on tap with tywin so that we can use reigns of castamere and then make sure that we can trigger any of the uh roos bolton commander cards that we really need to get out at that point or we can do something like protect a unit that might be getting charged when we didn't think it was going to be charged you know making sure that our knights of casterly rock are always functional and anything that gets into them kind of becomes less impactful with Reigns of Castamere. I know that uh, once per game abilities, they feel weird, right? Because you're paying these four points, and after Tywin has reigned all over the place, you, well, I guess not all over the place, it's just the one place, but once he's popped Reigns of Castamere, you kind of feel like he's lost his his pizzazz right because he doesn't do anything but since we have so many other ways of controlling our opponent's units and what they do in this game reigns of castamere is just a nice way to kind of get that control moving if your tactics deck is, or if your hand for your tactics cards is not looking really spicy or in the late game he can make sure that you're getting what you need when you've kind of run out of steam Or he's got this really reactionary element to him where he can just make sure to be the catalyst to do anything you want to do to set that tempo up in mid-game, which I feel like is where you really kind of bend or break um, as the control player. If your opponent, you find out whether your opponent's been able to push the momentum enough to kind of outpace your control, or you've kind of put them right under your thumb. And I think Tywin Lannister just makes sure that the, the the hold you put them under is a little bit more solidified. So again, just like the poor fellows, if this is not an NCU that you're really key keen on, I would definitely give it at least one shot and see what you think about it with the way that we have everything built in here because he is one part of the greater whole, which is really just shutting down everything our opponent can do. Now, when it comes to figuring out what kind of list to put this into, if you're looking at uh, across from something like a Free Folk player, I don't think this list is going to be a really big deal for them because they just have so many units that they don't care. At, at some point, you kind of 
can't control everything. Now we've got some things that can play into them pretty well. I think free folks struggle with three plus armor saves and they definitely struggle with cavalry that can kind of plunk them from the side and start taking them down one by one. And that not to say that Roos Bolton's cards aren't effective on them, it's just that they're not going to be the greatest. I think, you know, fear keeps a man alive, probably going to happen more often than not when you're playing against a Free Folk player. But if you're playing against someone who's dropping a more elite list, I think that this is a perfect list to kind of punish them for doing that. If you're thinking about, like, you know, the Loris, vi the Loris list that I had built, or any, really any Baratheon list that isn't just, like, a bunch of Wardens and, uh, and some Sentinels, I think that this list would really punish them quite a bit. So if you are a Lannister or neutral player, uh, well, if you're a neutral player, there's going to be some things you won't have access to, but you can definitely make this work. But if you are a Lannister player who is worried about what the Baratheons are bringing, I think this is a perfect list to kind of give them a run for their money and, and mess with them. It's very worth noting that in a meta where people think three NCUs is the right number to have, having someone like Tywin Lannister who doesn't need to be on the table or on the on the uh, command or the the tactics board in order to do what he wants to do is quite beneficial. It's kind of like uh, having Varys in there, which is a, another one that I could see coming into this list. But I really do feel like Tywin fits in well here. And uh, if you have any other alternatives to this list, because there's a, a whole bunch of different ways you can play Roose Bolton, post them in the comments below. I think that he is a really phen phenomenal control ca commander and. Uh, I think people would really like to see more of this kind of play style happen in A Song of Ice and Fire. We definitely have some uh, factions that can make it happen, but I don't think any commander quite takes it to the level that Roos does, and I feel like it's a, it's a shame that he isn't recognized as such because he is very brutal and just deserves more table time. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this list discussion. I know it got a little bit long, but this is definitely... A perspective in A Song of Ice and Fire that isn't talked about a whole lot, and uh, I felt like it needed just a little bit more time in order to kind of unravel all the pieces. Uh, I hope that you really enjoy this list if you do get a chance to play it, and let me know what you what your results were if you do happen to get a chance to throw this down, and, and, and I'll be happy to see what you think of it, even if you think it's trash. I, I, I really like this list and enjoy the play style. But I look forward to making the next one of these for you. They're really fun to do. I think I'm starting to get to the point where I'm going to run out of commanders, but I got a whole slew of Baratheon ones to do, so we'll get back to that eventually.